Hello, everyone. Good morning, good afternoon, and good evening. Welcome to yet another new episode in the webinar series brought to you by the AI and Machine Learning 5G Challenge. My name is Thomas Basco from the ITU, and it is my privilege to introduce today's webinar. The AI and Machine Learning 5G Challenge is organized by the ITU, which is a United Nations Agency for ICTs. The mandate of the ITU is to allocate frequencies to services that uses the radio spectrum, to develop standards, and to help uh, developing countries in setting up their ICT infrastructure. The challenge aims at creating a community that will solve network-related problems using AI and machine learning. We are very happy to inform you that this challenge is kindly sponsored by Xilinx, and we are very grateful to their sponsorship. Now, I would like to introduce today's speaker. Today's webinar is going to be given by Sevi Gugus. Sevi re received the Bachelor of Science degree in electrical, and computer, in electrical engineering with a minor in mechanical engineering, as well as the Master of Engineering in electrical engineering and computer science from MIT. This was in 1998 and 2000 respectively. And then she received the PhD in electric and computer engineering from Georgia Institute of Technology in 2009. From 2000 to 2004, she worked as a radar signal processing research engineer with the US Air Force Research Lab Sensors Directorate in New York, USA. She was an assistant professor with the Department of Electrical Engineering at Tobe University, Ankara in Turkey, as well as a senior research scientist with the Tubitak. Space Technology Research Institute. She is currently an assistant professor with the Department of Electrical and Computer Engineering, University of Alabama at Tuscaloosa. Her research interests include radar signal processing, physics-aware machine learning, human motion recognition for biomedical, vehicular, and autonomy, human-computer interaction applications, and sensor networks. She was a recipient of the 2020 SPIE Rising Research Award, the EU Marie Curie Research Fellowship, and the 2010 IEEE Rada Conference Best Student Paper Award. In today's talk, she will discuss how radar is different and the current trends in how researchers are trying to solve these challenges. New ideas of physics aware machine learning targeting RF signal classification will be presented. This will be alongside a challenge data, space, data set, which is specific to the classification of activities for daily living using RF sensor network. So I would like at this point to welcome Sevi. Good morning. Good morning. It's nice to see everyone today. Yeah, we are happy to have you today. And we are very eager to learn new things and about this challenge related to data that you're proposing. So the floor is yours. Again, uh, thank you very much for your invitation. I'm very happy to be able to talk with you today about this topic of uh, using RF sensors for the purposes of human motion recognition. The problem of understanding how people move is perhaps one of the most widespread uh, important challenges of our day. If you think about all the different applications for human motion sensing, which is more broadly termed human ambient intelligence, you can see on the slide here that there's really quite a, a wide range of things that we can do in terms of developing intelligent systems based on human motion. This includes applications of security where we might be interested in developing uh, intruder detectors, understanding occupancy, how many people are in the room for being able to have more energy efficient subsystems or even things like perimeter and individual defense. If you think of school shootings, which happen in the United States, we can use RF sensors, for example, to detect shooters and try to, to protect ourselves from this. Another very big uh, application area, which is perhaps where I would say most of the publications in uh, indoor monitoring are happening right now is in the areas of remote health monitoring and assisted living. So applications of vital sign monitoring, fall detection, fall risk assessment, trying to detect emergency situations, and then extending the capabilities of radar to move from just being kind of like a health emergency detector into really an early warning system where we may wish to detect, for example, gate abnormalities or other kinds of perturbations in our behavior 
for the purposes of having early warning in, in falls, uh, depression, or other kinds of neuromuscular disorders. There's also lots of smart environment applications where we might again be interested in the control of devices, uh, energy efficiency, as well as emergency response and human computer interaction. You know, in 2016, Google uh, released kind of their first information about their new Soli device, which is a 60 gigahertz radar small enough to be embedded in a wristwatch. And this has really paved the way for uh, a new interest in non-contact gesture recognition and control of devices using RF sensing. I myself personally, uh, over the last two, three years, have been trying to pioneer ways of using RF sensing for the purposes of sign language recognition. And so the applications of human motion sensing are growing by the day as RF sensors become smaller, more capable, and lower in cost. So why would we be interested in using radar for the purposes of human motion sensing? There are a lot of different types of sensors out there, which you may have already yourselves been working with. Things like cameras, ultrasound, acoustic sensors, infrared sensors, even seismic or vibration-based sensors. So this is not to say that you know, radar is going to somehow be a panacea and solve all the problems of human motion sensing out there. Every sensor has its own set of advantages and disadvantages. And depending on how, what type of application you have, uh, what your ultimate goal is, you may wish to use one or a combination of these types of sensors. What does radar bring to the board? Well, radar is a non-contact sensor. It can operate at even potentially large distances depending on what your output transmit power is. If your frequency is low enough, radar can penetrate through walls. It can do subsurface sensing. And most importantly, I think it's effective in the dark when there's no light. So video is something which is very often used for surveillance, but again, once nighttime comes and you don't have any external illumination, the visibility of radar cameras goes down and radar offers an alternative which is effective in those situations at much greater resolution. Depending on how you design your antenna, what the antenna beam pattern is, you can potentially have a, a very wide range of sensing. And it also protects privacy. And by privacy, I don't mean to say that somehow you can't hack a, a radar sensor and collect its data, but ultimately, even if you get the radar data, as I think you will appreciate by the end of this presentation, our way of visualizing radar data is such that we don't really uh, be able to recognize people's faces, what they look like, who they are, specifically from using their, their facial information. We can't, for example, collect images of what's going on in your room in terms of you know, whether there's a poster up or, you know, or what type of furniture you have. I mean, we can't even tell, <laughs> we can't even tell whether you're really wearing clothes or not, right? All radar is doing is really extracting range and velocity profiles of the motion. So in that sense, it is less invasive of a sensor than perhaps some of the alternatives, which makes it extremely attractive when you're trying to develop these kinds of ambient intelligence applications. So how, what type of challenges are there in, in terms of sensing? And how does this map in terms of more technical problems from the machine learning domain? One of the biggest problems I think with human motion sensing research is that you know humans can literally do almost anything. We have a very advanced kind of bipedal system of motion, which is, is quite unconstrained. So the traditional way of doing classification where you say, okay, I have let's say 10 activities and I'm going to recognize one of these 10 activities is what's, what's known as like a, a closed set recognition problem, right? You have the same activities in your test set as you have in your uh, training set. And this gets reflected as an open set problem because it doesn't matter how many activities you train on, I guarantee you, you'll have a test subject which does something different that's in your training set. So the open set problem is a huge issue, which I think is greatly under addressed, especially in the radar uh, papers, where I think we've only really looked at, for the daily activity problem, we've only gotten up to about, I would say 12 different activities in terms of dimensionality. Uh, in the research that I'm doing in sign language, I have about 100 different signs that I'm looking at, but that's still limited and it doesn't address the open set recognition problem. The other huge problem that we have is that really in RF applications, we don't have a lot of data. You know, video and image processing based applications, we have databases where you might have like an image net as much as 1 million images, which you can use for training. Well, if you look at the RF literature in uh, uh, human motion sensing, 
you'll find that typically you have about 1,000 or 2,000 samples. The largest database that I've seen is 17,000 samples for drone recognition. Not a human recognition problem, but still it involves collecting individual samples. Human subjects testing limits the number of samples greatly because to get every individual data sample right now, the traditional way of going about collecting data is having a person come in the lab, they walk back in front, in front of the radar, you collect your samples and then you get your training database. We need to be able to advance the state of the art so we get better performance in real world scenarios. Currently uh, among researchers who I know in my community, there's a great push to move away from these kind of controlled scenarios experiments into what I would consider a real world black box type of data collection where you would have an RF sensor that's mounted on a wall, kind of like a smoke de detector, and you would just get a continuous stream of data and try to classify it. Of course, the problem there now is you have a lot of potentially other targets than what you're trying to classify. You might have obstacles, pets, multiple people. You'll have furniture and different kinds of uh, scenarios. And the motion that you're collecting is not gonna be single activity data anymore. It's going to be a continuous sequence of sequential motions. So how do we do sequential modeling? How do we identify when we change from one activity to another? How can we kinematically capture that there's a transition region there? How do we separate some of these different moving targets which are in our environment and deal with dynamic interference? How can we interpret our data when now we have every single possible scenario in an uncontrolled fashion? And associated with this then is the problem of how do we get good ground truth how do we automatically label and caption our data so that if we collect data in a real environment, we have some kind of ground truth to which we can, we can do benchmarking. So when you think about all these challenges, you might say, oh my gosh, you know, how do we even begin to try to consider this problem? One of my objectives for the talk today is to kind of show you a window into what's been done so far in the radar community towards trying to address a small portion of these problems. So on this slide here, you have an outline of my talk. I'd like to start by talking just fundamentally about what measurements we can acquire with radar and what types of pre-processing signal processing we do to be able to generate a variety of different radar data representations. Unlike images in computer vision, we don't have just a single data format. The radar is collected as a complex time stream of IQ data which we apply signal processing on to generate a variety of different 2D, 3D, and 1D data representations. So even before we get to how we do the, the machine learning, you can see that there's this challenge also of what's the best way of presenting the RF data to the network. My talk today is gonna to focus on one particular type of data representation, which is the most widely used representation in most of the literature that you'll see on RF-based classification which is something known as the microdoppler signature. So I would like to introduce to you what the microdoppler signature is and some of the standard approaches for classifying microdoppler signatures and what some of the results have been attained today. And then I would like to really focus in on this problem of training data because in my experience, this has been really the first problem we encounter when we try to, to classify any kind of RF data. It's the fact that we simply don't have enough data to build very deep neural networks so how can we overcome this problem of low sample support? What are some of the new ideas that we're trying to pursue in terms of synthetic data generation? And how can we apply new concepts of physics aware machine learning for addressing the data insufficiency problem? At the end, I'd like to kind of transition into the specifics of the challenge problem, which is associated with this webinar and talk a little bit about the data that I'm posting, uh, some of the work that I've done with the data so far and maybe some of the challenge problems that we can try to address with this limited data set. So without further ado, let's kind of try to get into the meat of the talk and talk about radar. So radar is short for radio detection and ranging. It makes two or three basic measurements. The first one is just a distance measurement. So radar measures the radial distance or otherwise known as slant range between an antenna and the target. And it's measured simply by measuring the round trip travel time between the transmitted and reflected pulse. Distance equals rate times time. The radar moves at the speed of, of light. And so from there, you can kind of back out what the distance of the target is. The second important measurement that we make is based on the Doppler shift principle from physics. 
The Doppler shift is simply the idea that if an electromagnetic wave hits a moving object, the received uh, signal or the received wave that you get back is going to come back at a different frequency than what you transmit. And the difference between the transmitted frequency and the received frequency is known as the Doppler shift. And that is physically related to the radial velocity of the target. So if V is the absolute velocity of, let's say, a vehicle, V cosine theta would be the radial velocity component. This is what the radar is measuring. And it's also why police tend to hold the, 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 uh, the radar sensors they have in their hand towards you when you're coming down the road because they want to measure your maximum radial velocity. They don't want to measure you know, uh, the perpendicular velocity, the tangential velocity. If you have a radar system, like an automotive radar system, which is, has multiple channels, by channels, I mean multiple antennas uh, in, your, in your RF uh, transceiver system, then you can also start doing more creative things such as direction of arrival estimation. In commercially uh, made automotive radar systems, such as by Texas Instruments, which operate at 77 gigahertz, they have three or four different channels. Three or four channels does not really allow you very high resolution angle measurements, but it could allow you, for example, to, to understand, like I would say with about like plus minus 30 degree or so accuracy, what direction your signal is coming from. And that's another rich source of information that we can use. The way that we process the data usually is we take this time stream of complex IQ data that's given by the radar transceiver and we stack it. Uh, so what we call the range samples or fast times is just your analog to digital converter samples. Most radar systems are pulsed radar systems. So we'll stack the returns from each pulse in the vertical direction. So in the X axis, you have the ADC samples. In the Y axis, you have the pulse numbers. And if you have a multiple, if you have a radar system that has multiple channels, you'll then stack in a third direction, which is showing what your data matrix is from each antenna that you receive back. So ideally we get this kind of uh, a 3D data matrix out from the radar system. And from this data, we can do a lot of different radar signal processing algorithms to generate different representations. You can generate images using synthetic aperture imaging techniques. You can generate uh, what's known as microdoppler signatures by doing a time frequency transform along your slow time matrix. You can do beam forming to generate uh, the direction of arrival instrument information. And you can also generate you know, range maps, make combinations of your range measurements and velocity measurements. You can take Fourier transform forms of those measurements to generate things called radar, uh, cadence velocity or cadence frequency plots. Uh, the automotive radar systems have also pioneered kind of the, or provided the motivation for generating radar point clouds, which would be similar to LIDAR point clouds. The main problem being resolution. Radar point clouds tend to be very sparse and not really of significant resolution in comparison to LIDAR, which is a significant disadvantage. The other, other disadvantage of radar point clouds is that if you wanted to be able to this time extract a velocity measurement from your radar point cloud, you would have to take the difference in position versus time of the radar point cloud, which provides you a different way of measuring velocity than when you directly take advantage of the microdoppler effect. The microdoppler effect will give you a much higher resolution velocity measurement than by trying to back out that information from the time varying distance in radar point clouds. As a result, using microdoppler signatures, which basically it refers to the idea of computing a spectrogram or a short time Fourier transform of your radar data, which allows you to visualize the instantaneous microdoppler shift that you get in your single versus time has been a preferred way of doing activity recognition. But if you look within the last two years, there's a lot of new work coming out on how some of these different data representations can be used for human motion recognition. There's also some ideas coming out about trying to do complex value neural ne networks directly on the raw IQ data. I personally think that's a little bit of a challenging way of processing the data because it doesn't allow you to do any of the physics aware types of approaches that I'm going to be discussing. And I think when you try to extract the same information from the raw data, you're gonna need uh, deeper, more complex neural networks to extract the same information. But these are some of the ideas which are currently been debating in the community. And to my knowledge, there hasn't really been any one definitive work which really compares all of these different input representations and discusses which one might be more effective in which situation. 
right now, I think every researcher just kind of does what, what kind of feels best to them or what they think is more effective. So what I've shown here on this slide is an example of some of the microdoppler signatures for different kinds of motions, walking, limping, falling, using a wheelchair. And you can see that even visually with our own eyes, we can kind of discriminate the different patterns in these signatures. And once you've generated the, the microdoppler image, if you will, you can then apply any kind of machine learning you want to it. And so the conventional way of doing it would be to extract features, to select a subset of features, and then put it into your classifier of choice. Deep learning has really kind of pushed the state of the art in these types of pattern recognition applications for human activity recognition. Uh, and, but the problem, of course, with deep learning is that you need to have a lot of data, um, much more data than you would need to, let's say, apply a support vector machine. So how can we now deal with the data insufficiency problem? Given that we only have a few um, thousand samples of data, how can we effectively train deep neural networks? Um, I think there's a lot of different ideas out there for how this can be done. The two principal ones, I think would be unsupervised pre-training. If you use something like a convolutional autoencoder where you use the, uh, the autoencoder structure to do initialization of your weights, this, this does a very good initialization uh, of the weights and you're using uh, real data on both ends of it, or you can do transfer learning from a different modality. And in this regard, ImageNet has been a very good resource, which has been used for initializing the weights of neural nets. Uh, and then afterwards, you can take your RF data and do some amount of fine tuning, uh, given your specific problem of choice to be able to this time get your finally uh, trained neural network. Um, I've done a comparison on some RF um, human motion samples. This, this plot is for a 12, a 12 class human activity recognition problem where we have classes such as walking, limping, sitting, uh, and, and so forth. And the main takeaway of this plot, if you look at the, the red curve, which shows you the result for VGGNet, this would be the transfer learning based approach versus the convolutional autoencoder, which uses unsupervised pre-training, you can see that up in the right-hand corner at about 650 samples or so, these two lines cross each other. And what this means is that if you really don't have any data at all, using ImageNet for pre-training your network is quite effective. But if you have a modest amount of data, you know, at least 600 samples over all the 12 classes, then really using unsupervised pre-training approaches where you're only using your own kind of RF data for the training works more effectively. That's really good. But again, uh, even in the case of using the convolutional autoencoder, using that type of approach, you know, I found that I'm usually limited to just three or four layers. So if you really wanted to build a neural network that's much deeper, how could you, you really boost the depth, right? You need really a lot more data. One way of overcoming this problem is by generating synthetic data. There's a number of different ways of generating synthetic data. In the computer vision community, we're very familiar with generative adversarial networks. In the radar community, we're much more used to doing physics-based models for the purposes of synthesis. And so one way that we, in the human motion recognition problem, could do data synthesis in a physics-based way would be to take advantage of actually motion capture data from sensors such as the Kinect sensor or from more sophisticated camera systems such as the Vicon system, which basically gives you the time varying ranges for each point target on a skeleton. Once you get those time varying ranges from this other sensor, you can use that to back out the time delay that you would see and substitute that into a model for what the radar received signal would be. And in this equation, you can see that there's an exponential function here, which represents the linear frequency modulation on your radar signal. And the received power is given by the radar range equation, which is indicated in the second equation down here. And that tells you actually what your amplitude of the signal is. And you can then use this to kind of replicate the radar data that you expect to see, apply a short time to Fourier transform and obtain synthetic microdoppler images, such as what you've seen here. Now, of course, the problem with the mocap is that you're still dependent upon individual subjects to give you this data. But since you have access to the skeleton, you can apply data augmentation techniques on the skeleton itself to really grow the amount of samples you have. So I had a work that I did in 2018, 2019, where I took 55 mocap measurements, generated over 30,000 microdoppler signatures by scaling the axis in height speed and adding random perturbations to, to emulate different types of walking styles. This method performs much better than trying to do direct data augmentation directly on 
the image-based uh, microdoppler signatures, primarily because if you do any kind of scaling or transformations of the images itself, you're generating physically impossible variants. And this is something that's gonna become a theme through this talk, where in trying to do synthetic data generation, we really need to be sure that we're generating samples that's accurate, physically speaking. So if you use this network, if you use this data to try to, to train a deeper model, we were able to go as, as deep as 15 layers in a residual neural network and get performance that outperformed a lot of the other methods which we compared to at that time, which included transfer learning, convolutional neural networks, uh, convolutional autoencoders, as well as you know SVM and other types of data-driven techniques such as PCA. Well, what about generative adversarial networks? The main problem with mocap is that we cannot capture any of the environmental reflections that come when you do RF sensing. So for example, if you, you look at the, the chips on this slide, you can see that there are some horizontal artifacts. These were horizontal artifacts that were, were in the original data itself due to sensor noise, as well as due to the, the reflections from the furniture from the wall, which usually show up all, along the horizontal line, which is the zero Hertz line. So GANs have the benefit that they can capture these kinds of artifacts which are present in your real data. The problem is that they don't represent the human motion very accurately. And what I'm showing on this slide is how some of the GAN-based signatures have artifacts which really map to impossible things. There are just disjoint, disjoint components. Disjoint components are not usually possible because our body is a connected object. So you, you, don't, you never have dis, disjoint velocity components resulting from human motion. Um, you also have cases where you have like an impulsive fall, but instead of getting uh, velocities only positive and towards the radar, you're getting velocity components which are also negative and away from the radar. This would be as if the person was split into two and falling in two directions at once, which of course is not something that's actually possible. If you have dead spaces in between, this would correspond to the person stopping and then walking. And we also have situations where you have target signature leaking into the sensor artifacts, which is again something that's not physically possible. So this all causes GAN-based signatures to have degraded performance when you try to use them for uh, initializing deep neural networks for classification. One idea that we had was to try to remove the outliers by doing a kind of statistical sifting. We would generate a convex hull based on the real RF samples and basically eliminate all the synthetic samples that were deemed outliers based on the real data distribution. So if I have 40K GAN generated samples and I eliminate 9,000 of them, I get a 10% performance improvement. That's huge. And it gets to, to the point of how GAN generated signatures have a lot of kinematic errors in it. The real thing that we want to do though is we'd really like to try to come up with a way of synthesizing data that doesn't have in the very beginning all of these kinematic problems. This leads to the idea of physics aware machine learning. So on one hand, we have physics-based models, which may reflect a good degree of domain knowledge. It represents the phenomenology of electromagnetics. It reflects the sensor properties. We have target models and clutter models that are very well known in the radar community, but we don't have data. And if our model does not really capture completely what's going on in the sensing environment, and as you know, in the real world, there's always aspects that we cannot model. Even if we go into a very complex computational electromagnetic model, there's always gonna be aspects of the environment and our, and our situation that are not gonna be captured in the model. So there is a degree of uncertainty that we cannot model. That's where deep learning comes in. If we're able to take data, have a data-driven approach where we get new measurements and we're now able to learn aspects of the model that we could not represent physically, then this would be a great thing, right? So we could learn the unknown qualities of the dynamic chase in the environment, the target properties, the sensor artifacts, multipath, and that's great. So with deep learning, we have lots of data, but no physics. And since we don't have physics, we generate errors, errors that we wouldn't otherwise have if we had done physical model-based techniques. So physics aware ML is the idea that we want to really get the best of both worlds. We want to have some data, not a lot, and we want to have reasonable models, not computationally intractable, uh, you know, uh, finite element method based models. So how do we find the sweet spot? That's really what we want to do for human activity recognition.
So I want to give you some examples now of some ideas that I've pursued specific to the motion recognition problem that tries to espouse this philosophy. And these ideas are based on the idea that we really need to look at the envelope as one way of integrating our knowledge of human kinematics into the problem because the envelope of the microdoppler signature corresponds to the fastest moving point on the human body. And from that perspective, the envelope really provides an idea of what the physical bounds of your problem are. You shouldn't have anything synthesized that exceeds your real envelope. And you also want to make sure that the shape of your envelope is consistent because that gets reflected in different types of walking styles. So if you look at the signature we have here for normal walking versus walking on your toes, taking short steps or walking with a cane, you can see that each one of these different types of gates has their own kind of unique shape in the envelope. So how can we enforce consistency of the envelope in the GAN architecture? We have some different ideas that we explored to do this. The first one is to actually have an envelope extractor that extracts the envelope and adds another branch into the discriminator so that we have a multi-branch discriminator. We have one part of the discriminator which is extracting features from the, from the spectrogram or the microdoppler signature, but we also have another branch which is extracting features from the envelope. This accentuates the envelope properties and causes therefore to be a lot greater conformity in the resulting synthetic signatures. So if we look at the signatures on this slide, for example, on the left, we have real measurements for, uh, for um, walking. And on the right, the very most right, we have the multi-branch GAN signatures. And you can see that visually, they have a great deal of conformity. Well, what happens if we don't have that branch? The middle is like a, a Wasserstein GAN uh, using earth movers distance in the loss function. You can see that it's not able to keep up with all the periodicities of the normal human signature. It looks wispy. I mean, it's related, but even visually, we can see that it's really not capturing the distinct periodic properties of walking, which you would expect in a normal walking signature. So how can we kind of put some metrics then on how good or kinematically accurate a signature is? There are some metrics which have been developed for curve matching, such as dynamic time warping and the distribution for shed distance. We can also look at correlation as possible metrics. And what we can do is we can take these physics-based metrics now and add them into our loss function as another regularization term. This is what's in some uh, sources has been termed physics-based loss. What's the benefit of the physics-based loss? Well, what I've shown here is a TSNE plot of what the data looks like using TSNE, which is just a method of visualizing different features in a two-dimensional space in this case. So the red dots are the real data. And if we have perfectly synthesized signatures, we will want our synthetic data to be entirely overlapping with the space that's defined by these red dots. But what happens when we add in the multi-branch? We get the blue dots here. I didn't show the dots for the Wasserstein GAN, but if, you, if, if I would have plotted them, they're almost completely disjoint from the real signatures. So I didn't plot them. But the MBGAN plots you can see are the dark blue dots. And you can see that they at least conform with that kind of L-shaped cusp, but they don't quite reach the same extent on the right-hand side as some of the signatures. When you add loss regularization, you get one tick more overlap in terms of the synthetic distribution versus the real distribution, which is a good thing. That's what we want to happen. In terms of classification performance, how much impact does it have? Well, this is something that I'm currently looking into. I'm in the process of trying to collect a very large scale kind of more realistic data set, which I can use to really kind of push the limits of these algorithms. Currently, I just tested this on a very simple five class data set. And on this elementary data set, you can see it has about three, four, I'd say, no, four or 5% difference, right? The difference between 86 versus 89. So three, three to 5%. I've also tested this on sign language and there as well, it gives a performance boost over the alternatives. So this is one way that we can use to boost performance. And one of my areas of research is trying to come up with other ways that we can encourage GANs to have some amount of awareness of what's going on with the kinematics of our body so that it gets good target model. What are other ways we could classify the data? Do we have to synthesize data? Why not just take other sorts of RF data? I mean, I'm not the only one out there collecting data, right? I mean, there are so many low cost RF sensors out there. 
there's a lot of groups right now which are starting to publish different data sets. There's the team out of Delft and UCL specifically, which I know have published activity data sets and gesture data sets. Yeah, so the signal looks a little bit different, but you can see here on this slide, the microdoppler signatures for each of these sensors. And um, they have, they're very similar, but obviously there are some differences in shape. And so the key question that I first wanted to address is how much performance degradation or do I get performance degradation if I would use data from one sensor to train another? And what this slide is showing is that if you use uh, VGGNet to the initialization and then fine tune, you still get a huge performance gap between fine tuning on the 77 gig data and testing on any of the other modalities. I mean, the idea completely fails. It drops to as much as 14 to 16% versus when you have the same sensor data being used for fine tuning and testing. I tried the same thing with convolutional autoencoder. You can see the results here. Again, there's a huge performance gap where if you have the same frequency data, you would get very high results. And when you use a different sensor at a different frequency, you get very low results. So how can we bridge this gap? Synthetic data can help us bridge this gap. Here, I tried basically generating synthetic data using one sensor and then fine tuning with another sensor. Different techniques like domain adaptation can also come to bear here to help you transform the data from one sensor to resemble that of the other sensor. And all of this really helps. But this is still, in my opinion, uh, quite an unsolved problem because you know, all we're doing right now is really domain adaptation. And in the domain adaptation techniques, we haven't yet done anything to ensure the kinematic fidelity of the transformation process. So we're still introducing a lot of kinematic errors in the process of doing this. For the sake of time, I have not included the results that I have on this aspect, but this week I'm about to submit a paper which shows the, a comparison between domain adaptation versus directly synthesizing data for the purposes of American Sign Language recognition. And what that result shows basically is that you get so many kinematic errors in trying to do domain adaptation that doing direct synthesis with a multi-branch GAN outperforms the results. But this is currently an open problem and which is why I thought this might be an interesting data set for us to work with, because there's a lot of different things we can do with this data. Not only do we have multiple aspect angles and multiple sensors, we can take a look at, I think, other data sets which are being posted by other groups and see if we can, what we can do using transfer learning, domain adaptation, data synthesis, and taking advantage of mocap models to try to improve the interoperability and exploitation of multiple RF sensors for the purposes of classification. Um, I posted my web, my lab's website here because especially during COVID, I've posted a lot of web uh, videos of the conference presentations I've had of my recent work using this data set and other similar data sets, which may be of interest to participants interested in using this data. Uh, so you can take a look at those video presentations as well as the publications. Um, as well as you know, uh, other resources in general about radar. And I'm ready to, to kind of take your questions. I guess there's a lot to talk about here. So I wanna kind of pause here and have enough time to answer your questions. Um, but before I kind of uh, go into the q and I also want to just thank everyone for listening and emphasize that if there's any aspects of radar or signal processing or machine learning that has to do with this problem that you need support with as you try to work through the challenge problem, please feel free to reach out to me. I know this is a combination, but competition, but ultimately we just want to get the best possible results so that we can push the state of the art. And to that extent, I would be very happy to kind of engage with, with all of you in this, in this endeavor. Um, thanks very much for your time and I look forward to your questions. Thank you so much, Sevi, for the nice, interesting presentation. I think now the combination of radar as well as uh, AI machine learning is kind of producing new area, new interesting results. So we are glad that you are here to have this problem set for the participants of the ITU and Machine Learning 5G Challenge. Right now, we are going to open for Q&A. So I would like to invite my colleague Vishnu. Uh, hi, Vishnu. Good evening. Hi, Thomas. Hi, Sergey. Thank you so much. Excellent talk. Uh, I think I really like the way you laid out the ground rules first, uh, starting with the data collection challenges in several steps. You, you, I, have, I have noted down several of these challenges that you mentioned. 
this really, really a starting point, in my opinion, for anybody who is new, as well as, uh, you know, experienced in this kind of research. A really exciting field, as I can see, it is a really exciting field, as, as we talked before, I think the radar-based problems are quite interesting. Uh, I want to ask uh, about transfer learning. You, you mentioned two methods of transfer learning, actually. One mm -hmm. from the ImageNet uh, set of data and another from the other RF sources of data. So, mm -hmm. uh, you, you mentioned um, very briefly about ImageNet. I think uh, you didn't touch too much upon it. You did talk uh, a lot about uh, the, the other side of transfer learning that, that is using the other RF data. Quite interesting. And you did mention a key word that is interoperability. I mean, I mean we, we, we are all about interoperability. So it's quite interesting to us that you are talking about interoperability. So my question is that in, in both these methods, uh, where do we stand? Do you see future at all in this kind of methods? I know ImageNet probably is a shortcut, right? I mean, anybody, okay, there is a large database, you take it, you use it, okay. But in the RF data space, as you correctly pointed out, there is a lot more homework required to use uh, the RF data from other sensors. What is your, uh, could you elaborate a little bit more? Is that, is that a futuristic method at all? Yeah, so you, are you talking about Im ImageNet being futuristic or the other synthetic methods? Either way, you could compare, yeah. yeah so I think ImageNet, obviously, it, it definitely helps. But what I have found is that, um, like American Sign Language, I'm going to bring this up because I actually have a, a sign language data that has 100 classes in it. And so that's a very high dimensional problem. It's, it's much more challenging in terms of dimensionality than the data set that I'm, that I'm putting in here. Uh, but what we found on that data set is that even for that problem, doing uh, unsupervised pre-training on with the convolutional autoencoder on real RF data outperforms any kind of initialization that you can get with ImageNet. That having been said, however, if you did both, you get slightly better. Like if you were to initially do an initialization with ImageNet and then take synthetic data and try to fine tune it and then take real data and fine tune it again, it improves. But how much does it improve? It improves like three, three percent, right? Four percent. And so then it comes down to the point of, you know, is it really worth dealing with all of that data for that purpose? So I think I think the benefits of, of ImageNet are incremental in comparison with the performance gains that we can get by really improving our generative learning. So I feel like uh, I feel like investing more time in trying to understand how we can better, uh, you know, better control the data generation process, the synthesis process in GANs. You know, looking at different architectures of GANs as well, how they operate, what their assumptions are, what the cost functions are, how they're taking the data. You know, things like multitask learning, using multiple data representations, it, you know, can all help in doing this. The one kicker though, which actually I didn't mention, but since it now comes to mind, I should mention it, is that obviously we want all of these things to be real time. <laughs> and now when you get to real time, we have another challenge because it takes time to compute any one of these data representations. And if you go to end-to-end -end learning, however, our ability to get high recognition performance with end-to-end -end learning and directly operating on the, on the raw IQ data of the radar is very low. So how do you trade off? How do you trade off immediate requirements for getting some kind of sensing output in real-time applications with maybe some amount of analysis that you can do longer term? So to, to give you an example, I'm very much interested in the problem of detecting gait abnormalities for fall risk assessment. To do this, I really need an accurate network. I need to very accurately be able to characterize and recognize the envelopes and the components of motion. There's no way that I can do this kind of work on the raw data, to, you know, given the, the current state of things. That means I have to take the time to do the processing. And even if it's on an edge computing platform, it'll take time to generate the spectrograms. It'll take time to do the analyses, even if I've already trained the model. But what happens if I need 
to control my sensor in such a way that I get an immediate response? Or what if I want to detect a fall, for example, which requires immediate response? I'm not just trying to generate long-term biomedical data, I'm trying to respond right now. You can conceivably think about trying to develop different algorithms for different timescales in a task-oriented fashion. This is one of the directions that I'm trying to go with. And if you think about what this really means, it means taking the RF sensor and adding more intelligence to the node itself. Uh, one of the things that I was able to finally do this summer was take one of the automotive radars and be able to control it command line from Python, as opposed to using the GUIs that are standardly provided with those sensors. The reason for why this is important is because once you can do command line control, now you can actually directly hook that up to an edge computing platform. And now you can start investing the trade-offs between you know, real-time, near real-time processing and some of these longer term analyses that you might want to do less frequently during the day, such as gate analysis. Very good, very good, very exciting. Yes, thank you, thank you so much. There is a question which is, uh, which is actually, uh, when you started your presentation, I had this in my mind as well. The, uh, you, you, you are very focused on humans, uh, the uh, you know, human gait and the uh, sign language, everything related to humans. How can, is it possible to apply this kind of uh, techniques to other targets such as small, large cars, vehicles, etc., other objects? Yes, I'm, I'm very glad you brought this up and I probably should have added a slide in the beginning to address this. It's a very fundamental question, so thank you for asking it. But yes, anything, any type of object that has a vibration or a rotation will exhibit this type of microdoppler effect that I'm talking about. So even like a regular car, the rotation of the wheels on the car will show up in the microdoppler. If you have a tank, a, a tank for example, that has treaded, treaded tracks, that will look differently from like a normal vehicle. If you have a bicyclist, for example, you won't be seeing just the motion of the bicyclist's body. You'll see, be seeing primarily the rotation of the wheels and also drones, you know, drones and trying to be able to, you know, either enforce FCC rules, enforce, enforce fly zones, uh, you know, perimeter security, uh, safety, uh, you know, there's a concern in the United States about, you know, drones being used with, with uh, explosives and other types of, of threats. You know, uh, you can detect the rotation of the, the blades on a drone and you can even, for example, be able to count the blades measure the RPMs and be able to get an assessment of whether it's like a quad rotor or whether it has like six rotors or eight rotors. And that gives you an idea of what type of payload potentially the drone might be carrying if you're trying to do it for threat assessment, for example. So all of those things, yes, these same techniques can be, can be leveraged for that. Part of the reason for why I'm focused on humans, honestly speaking, is because in the United States, the work that has to do with drones is is pretty classified. And mm -hmm. I want to, you know, so, but humans mm -hmm. are everywhere, right? <laughs> but you're right that there's a lot of overlap with the techniques, the same principles can apply. To those how, how about how about robotic arms? Does this, uh, your techniques might be, I'm guessing that it may be more applicable, right? Because we come across several of these industry applications where this kind of techniques may be quite useful there. I am aware of only one or two works that have to do with using radar in the context of human robotic interaction. And they come from a team in uh, Fraunhofer based out of Stuttgart. Uh, if someone's interested in that, I can dig up uh, their papers and send it. Uh, if you're interested in doing that, there needs to be more work on that. You're right. That is an entirely open application area that could be used, that, could, that this can be applied to. Thank you. Thank you. And then I think there are some questions about uh, uh, the use of uh, neural networks. Yes. So uh, I think you, you did mention it in uh, one of the slides, but let me ask you anyways, because um, how does deep learning help in this, uh, in, in your methods at all? There are, as you mentioned, there are in one of the slides, you had this uh, on one side, you were capturing this physics-based techniques where you have less data and the other side you had this deep neural networks where um, you had a lot of data. Uh, yeah, yeah, this one. So the, the 
I think this answers the question, but let let me let me ask this question, which says classical methods for classification using micro Doppler um, with accurate uh, thresholding can be done. How does neural networks help? Yeah, so the neural networks are basically doing automatic feature extraction. And this is different from, of course, trying to design your own handcrafted features. Um, what are the handcrafted features? So the handcrafted features that have been used in micro Doppler are things like, for example, the amount of Doppler bandwidth you have, the periodicities within the Doppler frequency, envelope frequencies, where you look at the maximum uh, minimum of the envelopes. There are also transform-based features where you can use things like FFTs, FFT coefficients, DCT. Um, I did a work a couple of years ago on MEL frequency capsule coefficients. There was a time when MEL frequency was popular in radar. And it occurred to me that using MEL frequency didn't really make a lot of sense because MEL frequency relates to how we perceive sound. And it has nothing to do with the physics. Again, this gets to the physics aware ML aspect. Sometimes simple ideas can lead you to very amazing discoveries. So, um, well, I don't know how amazing it is. I shouldn't be too cocky about this, but interesting, interesting observations, let's say. Uh, and in the case of the MEL frequency, what I did was I just redesigned the filter bank in the MEL frequency to instead of being according to the MEL frequency, uh, I tried hyperbolic filters, which had more high frequency filters and which had positive as well as negative frequencies because you get negative frequencies in radar when you when you move towards or away, right? Your direct, the, the positive or negative frequencies depend on the direction of the motion. Uh, and I also played around with genetic algorithms for optimizing this. And just doing one simple step of optimizing the, the filter banks in this capsule coefficient computation process allowed me to generate features that were like on that particular data set I tried it out with, I got 20% performance improvement over MEL frequency. And then I compared it with convolutional autoencoders and convolutional autoencoders was only 0.1 different. On that particular data set, it was 12 activities. I think convolutional autoencoders got 92.2 and this, uh, I called it frequency warped capsule coefficients that I optimized the filter bank for got 92.1. So what is, how does this inform on the, the viewer's question? Well, what it means is that you can design features that can I, you know, perform comparably to uh, deep neural networks, but of course it requires a lot more effort, right? You have to put a lot of effort in, in how you're computing it, number one. But number two, it also shows you the, the power of doing frequency-based analysis and time frequency analysis in conjunction with the convolutional neural networks because all the frequency bank is doing, right? It's just splitting out the signal into different frequencies and then extracting coefficients from each frequency band. That frequency information is so important that it maps to essentially what the convolutional autoencoder is doing. So even though I couldn't really do an explainable AI technique to show that there's a one-to-one -one mapping, uh, I think it does kind of show as a testimonial to how if you really understand the physics of your problem, you can get really good results. But deep learning truly automates this process. And on much more complex data sets where maybe you would need even something more complex than the, the capsule filtering that I was doing, it allows you to, to automatically extract features that can give you a much better uh, level of discriminativity than trying to design this from scratch. Very good. Very good. I think your 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 technique amazing, amazing results. Yes, I think uh, that's really amazing. There is a question on interference. Yes. Um, so how does this come to play when you are using radars? Uh, where whether do you see interference as a challenge? Yes, interference is definitely a challenge, and it's definitely understudied. Uh, I would say most of the people who do human motion recognition they don't examine how their performance varies with SNR. Um, a couple of years ago, I did a simulation study on this where I added synthetic noise and interference so that I could be able to control the SNR levels that I was adding into my micro Doppler. And I found that pretty much none of the methods, including some of the earlier methods, I haven't tried the physics aware machine learning on different levels of SNR yet. That's one of the things I need to do. But on some of the earlier methods that I tried, if you had lower than 10 dB SNR, all of the methods failed. So interference is a problem. Also, prob, you know, investigating things about how to deal with jamming, how to deal with incomplete data, how to deal with obstructions. 
when you're only getting part of your signature, you're not getting the whole signature back, for example, is a problem. And I think this is one of the areas where having the, the models somehow sync up with the deep learning helps. Because if you can identify and detect when there's an obstruction, you can use the models to synthesize what that signature would have looked like with just, let's say, the upper body, right? And so that now gives you a way of, again, doing some kind of synthetic training on the, on the network to allow it to get better performance. Um, I attended a workshop last week on an IEEE conference for the International Microwave Symposium where one of the researchers from Infineon reported that, they dealt, that he dealt with uh, obstacles by essentially having a bunch of parallel networks that were independently trained for each one of these scenarios. Now, that's something that the industry is doing because currently there's no other better way of dealing with it. Finding a better way of dealing with it is a challenge and it needs to be addressed. We need to do something better than just having separate networks for every single possible scenario we can think of. Interesting, very interesting, yeah. Thank you so much. Um, I want to ask, uh, there is a question on sampling rate. Uh, could you look at it? What, what is the sampling rate required for capturing micro Doppler information? Uh, the, whether it is 70, 77, 24, 10 gigahertz, there's a question on that. Okay, that's a good question. And to be honest, I don't have a specific number in my head right now to report. Uh, I, I simply don't. Remember, a lot of these radar systems, even if they're at 77 gigahertz, they're base banded. So what I mean by that is that even if you're transmitting a signal at 77, it's mixed down so that the center frequency is eliminated and the only frequency component you get remaining is then essentially the bandwidth of your signal. And the bandwidth is then what really derives your ADC rate and you just have to satisfy the Nyquist criterion for doing that. There's a process in radar called stretch processing, which allows you Instead of using the entire bandwidth of the signal, it allows you to kind of look at the signal around a certain operating point. And by using stretch processing, you can further reduce bandwidth requirements so that you can reduce your ADC rate. Typically in the uh, software programmable radars, which I'm using like the TI-77 gig board, all of these things are different parameters which you can adjust in your GUI. And so I don't really have one fixed number that I can give you. Uh, but I can say that what you choose for this will depend on your application, because when you're dealing with applications like sign language, for example, you really need to have better temporal sampling. So it's better to submit, to, it's better to transmit frequent pulses, for example. And um, in other applications, such as the gross motion, maybe having a lot of bandwidth is not even important because you're not really trying to, you know, you're just looking at the microdoppler signature, you're not really caring about the particular location as much. And then you can get away with a much lower bandwidth and that will re reduce therefore your ADC requirements. So this is, I think the specific number would be a little bit application driven as well as what the capabilities of your sensor are and whether they give that to you as, a, as something that you can adjust. In the case of TI, you can adjust it, but you know, not, not all systems you can do that. Thank you. I, I think um, I found I found it really interesting, and I really look forward to reading your paper that uh, that you mentioned that the domain adaptation did not help or it will not help. It's quite interesting to I really look at look forward to reading that paper. Um, you know, it's it's it's, uh, it's amazing work, amazing work. I, I want to ask about um, the future work, I mean, uh, next year, if you were to, if you were to come back and give the same talk again, <laughs> would you, <laughs> what, what would you look at? I, I think, I think you hinted at something. Uh, let me ask this again. I think you, you talked about this large scale data, which you are collecting now. Maybe that's the thing. Maybe, maybe one of these techniques that you mentioned that, that may be the thing, maybe, I, I don't know. I want to ask you, what would be next year's exciting stuff? Uh, I want to draw some kind of extension for the participants to, to tell them where you are going with it. And this is, this is an exciting field. So what would you say to that? Well, the, the, the work that you mentioned where I compared the domain adaptation was on sign language and it has a hundred signs currently. So I could make that data available. I'm, I'm working to do that. As soon as I find out that my paper gets accepted, I'll probably release the data. <laughs> Um, so that's one area that, that could be worked in. And also, like you mentioned, the activity data, I'm planning to grow the number of classes that we're dealing with 
because I, I really uh, don't like the idea of just, you know, oh, everybody only looks at like a dozen classes, but we're so much more complicated than that. I think, you know, to have a data set which really covers a much wider scale of human motion and which is a person not just walking in a straight line anymore, something which at least has some amount of dynamics and variability within a room, even if it doesn't have the full degree of complexity of like obstacles and, and multiple people and so forth, to, to take this current data set and make it one tick more, more complex so that we have more challenges to deal with um, would be really good. Um, I may also be able to put together a sequential data set. This is something that also has not really been worked on. You know, all of the examples, if you notice what I've shown in this presentation, are dealing with one single activity. But nobody just does the same thing all the time. We're always changing what we do. So even if we're dealing with a closed set problem, what happens if I have a sequence of these? You know, yes, we can apply LSTMs and things like that. But the problem with LSTM is that LSTM is looking at the correlation between individual samples, right? It's not looking at the correlation between activities. And so what I would just put out there as food for thought is, you know, think about like your grandmother she can't just jump out of bed and start running the way a five-year-old child can. So how can we develop models that deal with, again, the physical human skeleton constrained sequential motions and correlations that exist between activities on a longer scale? How do we deal with that? Currently, we have no way of dealing with it because we're only dealing with it from sample to sample. And yes, we get results, but what I'm saying is that we can do better. There's room for improvement if we think of these types of things, in my opinion. Yeah, one last question. You know, you 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 you, you correctly pointed out that uh, data availability is a problem. Data collection is a problem. There are data representation problems. But at the same time, we hear about uh, you know so many of these companies doing autonomous vehicles and and uh, they, they seems to be on the road <laughs> so so what what, what is the what's the what's the uh, x factor there is it lidar which makes a difference or, or what it's, it's fusion even within radar for example so the same data that i that i presented for this challenge problem um i also have a paper on my website where we did fusion and again when you do fusion of multiple sensors the performance you know i i got like nearly perfect performance once you do fusion right so uh, the, the advantage of the automotive radar, automotive radar systems or the automotive sensing systems is they're fusing multiple domains. That having been said, I routinely get, uh, uh, I routinely meet people from the automotive industry who ask me two things. They ask me about how to do fusion with radar, and they ask me, do you have any students who know both machine learning and radar? Those are the two most often questions. So for any of you out there in the audience who's a student, I just want you to be motivated in this area. Because if you know radar and you know machine learning, you're like a million dollar guy right now for the automotive industry, because that's exactly the type of people they need to be able to solve these sensing challenges. Very interesting. That's exactly what we wanted to hear. Thank you. Thank you so much for uh, patiently answering. Actually, we are over the hour, but most most people are hanging around and the, it's a very exciting field. Uh, uh, thank you for for the for the uh, patience, uh, staying back and answering all the questions. Over to you, Thomas. Thank you so much, Vishnu, uh, for the Q and A, and I would like to thank Sevi for just a wonderful talk. We are very happy that you are hosting a problem statement for this challenge. We are looking forward to our participants to participate in this uh, problem statement and having interesting solutions. I know that you are trying to keep it open-ended and to see what kind of solutions we are going to get. So I would like to urge participants to check out this problem statement. It's problem statement number nine, RF sensor-based human activity recognition. I've shared the link in the chat window for the where you can register for the challenge. You can find it on our website, but also Sevi has been kind to put uh, some of the information on her website. So you can check on both websites and you can find this information. At this point in time, I would like to thank everyone who participated in today's webinar. Now, I would like to close this session. So thank you everyone for joining. And from me and my colleagues at the ITU and Machine 5 g I would like to wish you a very good day and I'll see you next week. Uh, Bye-bye.